Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Underwood. I work in community engagement at the Missouri Historical Society. And on behalf of MHS, I want to welcome you to STL History Live. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today for Groundbreakers, Rule Breakers, and Rebels with Katie Moon. Safety is a top priority for us, so nearly all of our programming is virtual right now, but the museum is open Wednesday through Sunday. We have several safety precautions in place, so we'd love for you to visit if that's something you feel safe doing. Advanced reservations are required for all three of the Missouri Historical Society locations. That includes the History Museum in Forest Park, the Library and Research Center on Skinker, and Soldiers Memorial Military Museum downtown. And you can visit mohistory.org to uh, plan your visit and reserve free tickets for any of the locations. Today's program is being presented in conjunction with the Beyond the Ballot exhibit. It's called Beyond the Ballot, St. Louis and Suffrage, presented by Wells Fargo. So I wanna thank them for their support, as well as Emerson, who is our education sponsor. I also know that some of you watching are Missouri Historical Society members, so I want to thank you. We are so grateful for your support. Um, if you're not a member, we would, of course, love for you to consider joining today. And in a few minutes, I'll go ahead and put a link um, in the chat box so you can learn more about how to do that. And I want to sincerely thank all the residents of St. Louis City and County as well for your tax contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District. Just a couple of quick things before we get started. Our STL History Live series runs twice a week, typically on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We also have Soldiers Memorial Chow and Chat programs, which run monthly, um, always on a Wednesday at noon. You can see all of our events on the events calendar at mohistory.org, or you can look at the events lineup on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page. And if you can't make it to any of the programs, um, you can always catch them on our YouTube channel. The Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel houses uh, videos of most of our programs that we've done. You can typically find them there within a week of the live program, sometimes sooner. Um, so please be sure to check those out. And then finally, we would love to get feedback from you. So at some point during this program, you're gonna notice that a tab pops up in your browser with a Kobo toolbox survey. And it just should take a couple minutes to fill out. So we would love to get your feedback and hear your thoughts about today's program. Okay, let's get to it. I am thrilled to be hosting today's program. Not only do I get to introduce my friend and colleague, Katie Moon, um, but we get to hear about this really exciting new book from Missouri Historical Society Press. I'm going to get to a picture of it. There it is, Groundbreakers, Rule Breakers, and Rebels. I keep tripping up over that, but I, I love the title. I'm just... Groundbreakers, Rule Breakers, and Rebels, 50 Unstoppable St. Louis Women. This book is an amazing showcase of women in St. Louis who made change in their communities. I know you're going to love hearing about it. As I said, it was written by Katie Moon, who is also our exhibits manager and was the content lead on the Beyond the Ballot exhibit. So she's going to talk a little bit about the book and some of the women that you'll learn about in the book for the next 30 minutes or so. And then we're going to have some time for questions. So be sure to drop any questions you have in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. And I'm going to, at this point, stop sharing my screen and make myself scarce and uh, turn it over to Katie. So Katie, you can take it away. <laughs> All right, so now I get to try to share my screen. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, Emily, can you see my screen? Hopefully, there we go. We got it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> slight technical difficulty. Someday I will get that all figured out. Um, so Emily, thank you so much for um, the, your introduction and um, I am the exhibits manager. My name is Katie Moon um, and I am delighted to share this information with you. This is actually the first presentation that I have done specifically about the book. So, um, so it's a little bit new information um, for me to present. So please bear with me as we do that. So hopefully um, some things will be new to you. Some things will be familiar, but um, definitely some uh, great women that we should all know their names. And that was one of the goals of the book is to really um, start talking about women and, and history in St. Louis and um, get more of that information out there. So um, as Emily said, the exhibit is open right now. Um, it opened in August and will be open through March of 2022. So plenty of time to come out and see that. Um, but if you um, are not comfortable getting outside and doing that, um, 
we do have the book available that has lots of information in it that is also in the exhibit. So this is a, um, a shot, a photograph from the exhibit that shows you the, the panels of women um, that we also highlight in the book. So just to give you an idea of, of what those look like kind of in, in real life um, that we've taken and, and put, in, put into book form. And Emily did tell you that the book is, is already available. So I have to tell you again. Uh, so first I wanted to give a shout out to um, the my partner in crime as we developed both the exhibit and the book. Um, Rory is a, a local illustrator. She is um, she's amazing and um, was fabulous to work with. And she will actually be doing her own presentation about her development of the illustrations. Um, I believe it's December 8th is, is the date that she's doing that. Um, but one of the reasons that we uh, that we went with Rory for this project is that she um, is enthusiastic about women's history. She's a local, and um, and she just does amazing work. And so um, it was really fun to work with her through this process and see how she really pulled in historical details into uh, into the illustrations that she does. Um, so you'll get you'll get more of that information as we go through here too, um, and then definitely more from her um, in December. So today I thought we could talk about um, five different women um, in St. Louis. We'll hopefully be able to get through all of them. We'll talk um, more about some and um, just kind of a nod to others, but these are all women who are who are highlighted in the book. Um, in the exhibit, we were limited to women um, before 1920, so before they received the right to vote. Um, and so in the book, 25 of those women um, from the exhibit are in the book, um, but then we added an additional 25 who are um, more modern women, such as Pearl Maddox and, in the center there and Rose Church, who's in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. Um, so it was exciting to be able to tell even more stories in the book. Um, women who, you know, were active through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, and who some of you might be familiar with um, and who remember, um, while the other women, um, you know, lived and, and did their work prior to uh, the turn of the 20th century. So um, so today we'll talk about a mix of those um, and some interesting stories and, and talk about how uh, they were involved in politics and, and influencing the city, um, some before they ever had the right to vote. Um, so the first woman we're going to talk to talk about is Susan Blow um, for the primary reason that um, there's this great article that I found in a newspaper from 1880. And uh, there was a woman who was actually critical of Susan Blow um, and the work that she was doing. Um, but in that letter said, she may be a suffragist, but she didn't wait for the ballot to do what she could in the world. And um, as I was, as I was researching these women for specifically for the exhibit, um, that phrase kept coming back to me that, um, you know, these these women who had no real political voice, no political power, were still able to do these amazing things for our city um, and create national and international uh, change and influence. And, uh, and Susan Blow was one of those those women um, who was known nationally and inter inter internationally um, without ever having the right to vote. And uh, there's Rory's illustration of her on the right. Um, and here's also some historical images of her. Uh, th that's her on the bottom, bottom right-hand corner. And her claim to fame is that she actually started the first public kindergarten in the entire United States. Uh, she was born into a wealthy family in St. Louis. She was, um, believe the second oldest of, of six children and uh, traveled with her father to Germany and different places in Europe and studied under um, the philosopher Frabel, who had a philosophy about how children learn uh, the best way that children learn. And she came back after studying under him in Germany and approached the, the superintendent of St. Louis schools and said, I want to start a free public kindergarten um, in Carondelet, which is where she was from in South St. Louis. And he agreed. And in 1873, she opened that very first kin public kindergarten in the entire country. And now we have over 4 million children who go to kindergarten every year. Um, 
that first year she taught about 50 children. Um, within five years, uh, there were 50, 50 kindergartens in, um, in St. Louis that, that had all been started by her. And that very first kindergarten in, um, down in De Pere, the De Pere School is still functioning today, is still an open kindergarten. Um, so if you or your children or your grandchildren went to a public kindergarten, uh, you have Susan Blow to thank. And um, unfortunately she had to retire early because of some health problems that she had, but she continued to write and, uh, and contribute academically um, across, the, across the world about, about um, kindergartens. So, um, but I keep going back to that, you know, she didn't wait for the ballot. She didn't wait for the perfect moment uh, to do what she needed to do. Um, and that's really a, a great way to think about the rest of these women um, and their stories is that they just, they saw a need, they stepped in and, uh, and they made changes and uh, just did some incredible things. So the second person I want to talk about is someone who might be familiar to you, um, but in the book we take a, a little bit of a, a different perspective of, of her story, um, and that's uh, Madame Marie Therese Bourgeois Chateau. And many of many people know her as um, Widow Chateau or Madame Chateau, um, and. Uh, we often think about her, uh, at least for those of us in the museum world, in the history world, this is the only image that we have of her. Um, and it's in our collection here at the, at the Historical Society. And uh, as you can tell, she uh, is, is no longer young, uh, no longer in the prime of her life in this image, probably in her 70s. Um, and so when I used to think about Madame Chateau, uh, this is how I would imagine her. Um, but as I was thinking about the story that I wanted to tell about her um, and her life, um, I really wanted to start thinking about how she would have been as a younger woman. And, uh, and so in order to create this image of her on the left, which is the one that we use in the exhibit, um, I actually sent uh, the oil painting um, at the top center, sent it um, with, through the magic of technology uh, to an internet service that does uh, regressions of photos and uh, oil paintings and uh, sent it to them and worked with one of their artists um, to make sure that the clothing style was correct and, and all sorts of things. And this picture on the right is actually the one that they sent back um, of, of what they imagined that she would have looked like in her early 30s. Um, and in the, the early days of St. Louis, she was the first European woman to come to St. Louis. And she was in her early 30s. And when she came to St. Louis, um, she was the mother of five. And um, Auguste, her oldest son, she had had with her husband, whom she married at 15 and had Auguste at the age of 16. Um, but her husband left her and, uh, and she started a romantic relationship with Pierre Laclede, who ended up coming to St. Louis with her son, Auguste, um, and founded the city in 1764. And, um, and so we're not exactly sure how many of her children um, were fathered by her husband, Rene, um, and how many were Laclede's children. Um, but we do know that when she came from New Orleans up the Mississippi River, she came on her own with four children under the age of seven. Um, and just to think about that journey that she took to this fur trading post, that there were very few buildings. Um, like I said, she was the first European woman here. Um, and so, and she was, she was um, in an estranged marriage and yet in this relationship with Laclede. And so, so many unknowns that she was walking into um, and to think about the woman that she became in the city. Um, we really wanted to portray that through the illustration that we created for her. And you can see some of the, the, working, um, the working illustrations that Rory started with. Um, that we really, you know, kind of worked through coloring and um, and and even facial expressions and um, and you know clothing, just to convey kind of who she was as a as a younger woman um, when she was entering this this brand new um, territory. 
Um, and in the exhibit, we were also able to include some of some archival images um, related to her. Uh, and um, and so uh, on the, the left, the bottom bottom left is just an early map of St. Louis, um, just to give you an idea really of, of those are city blocks of how small the city was at that point, um, that everyone really knew each other and uh, was in relationship with each other. And for her to have such power in the community um, was pretty amazing for, for a woman at that time. Um, and the house at the top is the one that Laclede built for her and her children. Um, it's interesting to note that all five of her children uh, were known as Chateaus. They never took Laclede's name. And, um, and so she, she actually maintained more power that way, um, continuing to have the Chateau name and as a widow, she never married Laclede despite having a relationship with him. Um, and some of that was probably because he was, he maintained a lot of debt and she didn't want to take that on. Um, and also uh, as, a, as a widow, she maintained more power in the community, um, had more legal power and legal, legal leeway um, as a widow um, than she would have as a married woman. Um, and on the right hand side is a family tree, a Chateau family tree from uh, 1900. And so you can imagine 120 years later, how many, um, how many of her descendants are out there um, who you know, all are tied back to her, uh, which is an amazing thing to think about. And while she was kind of the matriarch of St. Louis, she really controlled who, who her children married. Um, she had political power. She influenced the decisions that were made in the city. So in a lot of ways, she very much was the mother of St. Louis and um, created the city that, that we know today and, and had a lot of that influence. Um, so fortunately, we know a lot about her um, and her story, and there is a lot more to know. And, uh, you know, one of the limitations of the book is that we had, we had one page to tell the stories of these women, and they really are a starting point um, for those of you who are, you know, interested in history and really want to know more. There's definitely more complexities um, to her story, uh, lot, lots more ins and outs of her relationship with her husband, her first husband, and also um, with Laclede. Um, but, uh, but she was a, a woman of, of strength and resilience. Um, and I just love that story of her coming on her own and you know, having these children with her, the youngest of who was six months old. Um, you know, coming up this boat on the Mississippi. So um, just to give you a little bit of a different perspective of, of her and her life, um, instead of that image of her as an older woman, um, settled and, and with power, um, she, didn't, she didn't enter the community that way. She really created that life for herself, which is, which is amazing to think about. So the next person I want to talk about um, is, if you've heard me give a presentation before, you've probably heard the name Virginia Miner. Um, and she is a woman that we also highlight in the exhibit because of her work with the suffrage movement. And uh, she is an amazing woman and one of those people that I think everyone in the United States should know her name. She should be included in every story that we tell about suffrage and yet is often glossed over or a side note. Um, and so in, in the exhibit and in the book, we really wanted to take the time to tell her story and, uh, and share more about her, um, her influence, not just in St. Louis, but in the country um, as a suffragist and as an advocate for women's rights. So um, just to give you a little bit more of her background, um, that image on the right is one of two that I'm aware of that exist for her. Uh, but she, she was around during the Civil War era. Uh, she was born in 1824 and uh, she was born in Virginia, thus the name, um, and actually married a distant cousin, uh, Francis Minor, who was an attorney. 
And although they were both um, born and raised in the South, um, they were very familiar with slavery and um, you know, were raised in wealthier families who lived on plantations. They were both abolitionists and both union supporters. And so in the 1840s, they moved to St. Louis, um, I believe in order to find um, more people who are sympathetic with their views um, and to find you know, friendships and, and to um, show their support of the union. Um, she was a close friend of Susan B. Anthony. Um, Susan B. Anthony spent a, a lot of time in St. Louis uh, following the Civil War and often um, spent, spent her weeks here with the miners in their house. And uh, oh, to be a, you know, a, a fly on the wall and hear their discussions and, and uh, arguments about the rights of women and, and strategy and different things, I think would have been um, incredible. Um, unfortunately, Virginia only had one child, and he was killed in a gunfire accident uh, in the last days of the Civil War. Um, and so uh, she was a volunteer during that time, but also with the loss of her son. Um, after the Civil War, she devoted herself to the suffrage movement and, uh, and was able to do that and was supported fully by, by her husband to do that. Um, in 1867, she organized the Women's Suffrage Association, which was the first suffrage organization in the entire country devoted entirely to that cause. Um, prior to the Civil War, um, abolition, the freeing, freeing of slaves um, and women's rights were often tied together in organizations. Um, but she realized after the Civil War that the focus needed to go towards um, the rights of women and the, the right of, of women to vote. And so she gathered those, those first few women, I believe there were about 12 of them, um, to meet at the Mercantile Library and created the Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and, um, and so as that was going, um, she was discussing with her husband, the 14th Amendment, which, um, which had just been passed after the Civil War, um, because there were all of these discussions about citizenship and the rights of citizenship, um, people who had been enslaved and who were now free could they be full citizens of the United States if a person had fought for the Confederacy and, um, you know, but had now signed the Union Oath, could they be, were they citizens? Did they have the right to vote? Um, and so the Supreme Court passed the 14th Amendment that said that all persons born or naturalized are citizens of the United States and that no state can abridge those privileges of citizens. Um, and so she and her husband talked about this amendment and they came up with this philosophy that was radical at the time called the new departure. And it was a basic um, three-step philosophy. Their first, um, first, the first um, piece of that argument was that women are citizens of the United States. The second piece was that one of the rights or the privileges of citizenship is the right to vote. And if you put those two things together, then women already have as citizens the right to vote. So their argument was that because of the 14th Amendment, that, um, that women had the right to vote, that one of the rights of citizenship was the right to vote. But it was that second piece that they had to test, that they had to test and confirm through the court system. Um, because there was a question of, if you were a citizen, does that automatically guarantee you the right to vote? So that was, that was the big question. Um, but um, she introduced this philosophy in 1869 um, when St. Louis hosted the very first suffrage convention um, in the entire country. Um, it happened at the Mercantile Library, which was the center of lots of these things. Um, 300 men and women attended, um, several from different parts of the country, including Susan B. Anthony. Um, and both Virginia and Francis gave speeches uh, that were later published in the National Suffrage newspaper. And the suffragists embraced this idea of the new departure. 
and really thought that this was going to get them the vote. And remember, this was in 1869, 1870, that they were really um, embracing this. Um, Susan B. Anthony attempted to vote in 1871, um, and that's usually the story that we hear, that she was arrested and fined $100 for attempting to vote. And she did that because she embraced the new departure philosophy um, because of what Virginia was saying. But the miners knew that they needed to test this philosophy in the court system. And so in 1872, uh, Virginia walked up the steps of what we now think of as the old courthouse. Um, and she attempted to register to vote. And she was denied that attempt, um, which she must have known that she was going to be denied that attempt. Um, and so along with her husband, they filed an appeal. Um, as a woman, she was not allowed to take her own case to court. And so Francis had to file that for her. Um, and, and they took it to the, the St. Louis Circuit Court and then to the Missouri Supreme Court. And it ended up all the way in the US Supreme Court. And so the eyes of the nation were on this court case at the time. Um, the suffragists knew that depending on how the Supreme Court ruled in this decision, um, that women could have the right to vote as early as 1874, 1875. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court came back and said, you, you, that, and said that citizenship is not a guarantee of voting rights. Um, and so it just, it boggles the mind to think that they came back and said that that was the case. Um, and it destroyed the suffrage movement at that point. It just, um, it was demoralizing and um, it really set them back decades. And it wouldn't be until the, the turn of the century that they kind of gathered their wits and, and organized again and fought for suffrage. Um, but this, this court case also opened um, open the door for, um, for the states to step in and create more hurdles to voting. Um, because, uh, because the court said, you know, just because you're a citizen doesn't give you the right to vote. And so the states could say, okay, you know, they enter their, their, the Jim Crow laws, there's poll taxes, there's literacy tests, all of these things came as a result of, of this Virginia minor case. Um, and so she was, she was an amazing woman and uh, was often talked about as the heart of the suffrage movement. And, uh, and when she died in 1894, um, we really lost um, one of the early warriors for, for women's suffrage. Um, and again, she has a fascinating story. And this is just one element of, of her life. Um, and so there's, there's much more to learn about her, but, um, but at least to know her name and know a little bit about her um, is our goal with the exhibit and with the book. Um, so we are going to jump ahead uh, lots of years um, to 1944 and talk about um, one of the more modern women in the book. Um, and if you were able to visit our um, civil rights exhibit that was open several years ago, you might remember um, Pearl Maddox. Um, but she was another um, uh, amazing woman in St. Louis that so many people have never have never heard of and uh, just deserves so much credit um, for her groundbreaking work in the civil rights movement. Um, so she was um, she was born in 19. Oh no, I was supposed to remember this, um, I, right around the turn of the century. Um, and during, during World War II, um, did a lot of work with, um, with civil rights and women, uh, women of color were going to the factories and, and going different places and were not being hired because of their color. And so she, along with several woman, women, other women, worked with the NAACP and actually brought suit against several of these companies saying that they were overlooked in hiring um, and, uh, and, and fought in that way um, because they were really saying that, you know, our husbands and our sons are fighting, uh, are fighting overseas for our democracy and for, um, for our country and yet we're here and and we can't even get hired. And um, so they called it double V, double victory. Um, and so she was part of, of that movement. But then in 1944, she actually created um, 
and organized the Citizen Civil Rights Committee, which, um, which was an early women's organization um, that was an integrated movement. Um, it was both black and white women um, who were the, the earliest group um, to really organize sit-ins at local department stores. And uh, I love this image on the left. It's actually, um, it's part of the Mercantiles collection, um, but I believe that's Pearl, that's Pearl um, the second from the left there with that fabulous hat on. Um, but they here are at um, one of the large department stores in St. Louis. Um, and these department stores in the 1940s would allow um, African Americans to, um, to shop but they would not allow them to eat at the lunch counters. Um, they would allow them to work in different in um, different capacities, but they could not eat or get served at the lunch counters. And so um, Pearl Maddox organized these sit-ins. Um, and we often think about the sit-in movement um, as a Southern phenomenon in Greensboro, um, North Carolina, and um, you know Mississippi and different things that didn't start until the 60s. Um, in St. Louis, they started, um, actually there was one in 1930, um, but this was the, the first organized movement in 1944. And uh, in this group of women, at one point there were 55 of them that went to the three main um, three main department stores in, um, in St. Louis, and they sat at the lunch counters and simply sat there and, and asked to be served. And, uh, and in July of 1944, there were 55 of them, and they went to these three different department stores, and instead of serving them, all of the department stores just shut down for the day. Um, but these women went weekly um, for nearly a year and sat at these lunch counters. Um, and, uh, and Pearl Maddox was really the organizer and the, the strength and the resilience behind that movement. Um, while they didn't find success that first year, um, she really set a precedent for nonviolent protest in St. Louis that would characterize protest in, in St. Louis for the next several decades. Um, so she was really um, a groundbreaking woman um, who did this amazing thing and was so ahead of her time um, that it's just incredible that these that these women were doing doing these things um, in St. Louis at that time. Um, so another story, another person um, that is so so important for us to know. So the last person I wanted to talk about um, is Rose Church, who um, who was active in the 1950s and, and later. Um, she has such a great story. And I first heard about her when I first started at the History Museum um, 10 years ago because, um, uh, because a coworker, Jody Sowell, had, had had a chance to interview her uh, before she passed away in 2012. Um, <clears throat> But I had never heard of her before, and um, but she was definitely a given to be included in the book um, because she was the very first uh, space nurse, very first aerospace nurse. Um, she was hired in 1951 as an industrial nurse at, at uh, McDonnell Douglas, and in 1959, when they put out the advertisement for um, an aerospace physician, she went to James McDonnell and said, you know, if you have a doctor, you need a nurse. And, uh, and you know, she met him in his office and she convinced him um, that she should be the very first aerospace nurse. And, uh, and, and he agreed. Uh, she had to take scuba lessons. Uh, she had to, you know, go, go through a couple of different other things. Um, but she ended up being the, the nurse who took care of those early um, astronauts. She knew Neil Armstrong. She knew Jim Lovell, who was the, the person that um, I know from the movie, Tom Hanks um, was in Apollo 13. Um, but Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard, um, she knew all of those men. She knew what they liked to eat. She joked with them, um, but she also took care of them and was the person that made sure that they were physically able to 
um, to go into space. And she was a firsthand witness to those things. Um, and she, so she did that for, um, for several years. Um, but then when Donald Douglas lost the Apollo contract, um, she stopped working um, there and, and took, and her life went a different route. Um, but in her retirement ended up uh, going around to different museums and different schools um, with the spacesuits. Um, and and giving presentations about her her experiences as as a nurse at McDonnell Douglas, um, and so she was the first first person to ever do that. And um, you know to think about a woman who had a firsthand a firsthand view of of uh, the space race during during the Cold War in in the you know the late fifties and early sixties um, is just incredible. And I even forgot to show you the photos. So here are some um, some early photos of of her. Um, you know, it was a different it was a different era and uh, in some ways more laid back. And she was able to you know experience more things. Um, than, than I think you know nurses and medical personnel even are today. Um, and that was her, um, the bottom left, um, when she was in her late 80s. Um, and I'm gonna attempt, I have a little clip of her interview and I wanna see, it's just, a, um, it's just audio, but I've never done this before. So let's see if, um, if this will actually play. Um, it is about, it's about three, four minutes long. So we'll see if this works, if not, um, this is the last slide, so we'll, we'll give it a shot and see what happens. When astronauts came to St. Louis, an excerpt from an oral history with Rose Church from the collections of the Missouri History Museum. I felt like they were just test pilots, which they were. And uh, they're, they're all different. Even the test pilots are all different personalities. Some are quiet, some are louder, some don't, uh, uh, you know, are just sure of themselves and uh, that kind of thing. And the astronauts were the same because they were test pilots. Some, as I said, were easier to talk to than others. And uh, Neil Armstrong didn't say much of anything. And uh, he'd sit there with his legs crossed in the chair, with his a space suit on, ready to go into the chamber. And he'd be pre-breathing 100% oxygen for one hour uh, to get rid of the nitrogen. And he'd sit there and you'd have to jump over his feet to get by. And he wouldn't say a word. And uh, I've always said that uh, um, if I got a yes or a no out of him, that was conversation. He hardly says boo. And yet for him to share his words or knowledge with us on the moon, I wondered what he was going to say or do. Well, anyway, he had a little quirk to say, which was written for him. But that's all he said. Whereas uh, people like Alan Shepard went up there and tried to hit the golf ball and um, some uh, Pete Conrad is bouncing around on the moon and laughing, having a good time. But Neil Armstrong is a very quiet man. So hopefully you could actually hear that <laughs> um, and enjoy that. She does have a longer interview, um, and it's something that we can um, we can we can link up um, on YouTube or on our website if you if you would like to hear more of that. But, um, you know, she's one of the few women that we uh, have have a video of and and have that um, have that information about in her in her whole oral history. Um, so for so many of these women, we just have archival documents and for some of them, we don't even have images. Um, but for her, we do. And that's pretty special. Um, so when astronaut. Oh, so those were the women that I wanted to share with you today. Um, and those are just five of the 50 women that we highlight in the book. Um, so hopefully that gave you a little taste and whet your appetite a little bit. Um, and and uh, now you wanna go out and buy the book. But um, if you do have any questions, um, I think Emily and I will have a little conversation here. Um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, it's just kmoon at mohistory.org. Um, or if you have more information about any of these women, um, I would love to hear about it. So um, I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen because I know Emily has other things to share. Um, but thank you so much 
much for allowing me to do this and, and hopefully it was enjoyable for you as well. Thank you, Katie. That was really great. I loved hearing about all these women. We're getting some nice comments coming through and uh, in the chat of the Q&A also. And actually we have another uh, author in the audience today who's Portuguese and has written a book about Portuguese, pi pioneering Portuguese women. Um, and she mentioned that she had the same problem of two, not enough room to fit everybody you want to fit <laughs> in. And I think, Absolutely. you know, you'd probably find something, a similar situation almost anywhere you went um, around the world, around the country, you'd find innumerable stories of women. So I guess that brings me to my first question, which is how on earth did you even begin to figure out what your pool of women was to choose from. I, I know I got to witness some of that process of where we started and how we narrowed it down, but um, yeah, how did you even get that started and, and how did you do the research on that? Right, so it was actually, um, uh, it was an interesting challenge, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, some of the, you know, when I first started this project, my, my biggest concern was, am I gonna be able to find enough enough women? Am I going to be able to identify enough stories to be able to include in the exhibit, you know, let alone the book? And um, I was ha happily surprised to find that, you know, I had this list of, you know, 150, 200 women, and these were pre-1920. Um, and so we did meet as a, as a larger team and uh, had discussions and uh, arguments and, you know, and really decided um, you know, who, who was the best, not representative, but who had the most kind of interesting story? Who did we know the most about? Um, but also, you know, we're really committed to creating a diverse pool of the stories that we were telling and, um, you know, wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, women of, of as many ethnicities as we could were included. Um, but not just that, also, you know, kind of, uh, you know, what, what background were they coming from? What, you know, what, you know, was it medicine or was it, you know, social work or journalists or attorneys? Um, and so we were really committed to, you know, telling the breadth of stories. Um, and in many, in many ways did that with the more modern women as well. Um, you know, the more, the more modern you get, the more people are familiar with their stories. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure that we included some of those, you know, more famous women, but also some of those women that, that maybe not a lot of people know about, and yet we should. Um, but yeah, it was tough. I mean, I have enough to, you know, do like eight more books. <laughs> <laughs> So it'll be a series, right? Is, that right. The, is this right the official off. announce of the Groundbreakers, Rule Breakers, and Rebels series? <laughs> I'll take a little break for a while. Okay, I'll give you that. You deserve okay. a little break from that. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, I wondered, actually, well, you kind of spoke to that. Are there any, uh, there were stories that had to be left out. Are there any stories that you were just Oh, such a painful choice that you really wished you could have included, but um, for whatever reason, maybe we didn't have enough um, archival materials about them or, or their, you know, whatever it was, maybe they didn't get to, we didn't include them. Right. So one of my favorite stories um, is actually a really early one. Um, there was a, a free woman of color um, in St. Louis whose name was Marie La Bastille. And, uh, and she actually owned property. She owned a house at the very center of the city. Um, and, uh, and she had a neighbor who really wanted her house, who really wanted her property um, because it was in a prime location. And uh, she was getting older and you know, this man just bothered her and bothered her. And, uh, and, and so she finally said, okay, I will sign over my house to you under these conditions. Um, you have to uh, let me stay free, free of charge until I die. And you also have to provide me with this list of stuff, which included firewood, uh, beef, flour, coffee. You know, you have to give me these things every year until I die. And so he thought he was getting this great deal, you know. Um, she ended up living for 14 years. <laughs> so she basically had everything taken care of for her. Um, and just to think about, you know, her as a businesswoman and, uh, you know, just work in the system. Um, and I love her story, but we don't, you know, it was a paragraph in a book that I found. Um, and so there's just not enough information there to really create a whole story about her. 
Um, but that's just one example of, of one of those women that I would love to include if, if, I, if I could. Um, but it just makes me happy to, to know it in my own head. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered, um, this was something you and I had chatted about a little bit, it just just for people who are interested in purchasing the book and maybe thinking about getting it for uh, some of the women and girls in their lives or the men, I'm sorry, we keep saying get it for the women in your lives, but the men should be reading this too, it's right? True. These are stories it's for true. everyone. This is not just a, a woman's book. That's right. um, but I am curious about age range and so who is the book appropriate for? Right, right. So I know the illustrations, um, you know, I mean, they're, they're so accessible and, and Rory did such an amazing job. Um, but some of the subject matter is a little bit more mature. Mm -hmm. um, so I typically say uh, 12 and up, uh, mature readers, 12 and up. Um, you know, I mean, it's up to parents how much they want, you know, and I mean, some of the stories are appropriate for five-year-olds, um, you know, but we do include stories of um, brothel owners and there are some stories about, you know, physical abuse and, and marriages and just some harder, you know, some harder topics. Um, but I think 12 and up is probably, probably appropriate. And you mentioned Rory in the illustrations, and I know you mentioned this in the talk, but just to reiterate, Rory will be talking about her illustrations on uh, December 8th at 11 a.m. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say about Rory and how she, how you worked with her. Um, I don't want to say too much because I want to let her say, <laughs> say plenty on, on December 8th, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the reasons that we, um, that we chose her as our illustrator is that she had created um, of her own, um, you know, motivated by herself <laughs> um, to do a hundred women in a hundred days and uh, international women um, and their contributions, you know, across the board. And um, she has a poster on her website and, you know, she just has just done some amazing work and is a historian in her own right. Um, and if you look at the illustrations in the book, they tell the story. She does this amazing job of by the the backgrounds that she puts in and the details that she yeah. includes. Um, it just it really tells the story and lives on its own. Um, and so, um, you know, even just seeing the illustrations is is worth the cost of the book. Um, so I, I was just she's just great to work with, and it's just phenomenal. It's a gift that I do not have, uh, and so I very much appreciate that. They didn't ask me to do the illustration. <laughs> Nobody would buy that book. Big figures. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question uh, from somebody who was watching today to ask if, it, she's asking, is there a great gap between then and now? And I, I'm not sure if that means um, between what you see in terms of women sort of, you know, taking the reins and, and uh, making their voices heard then versus now. I, I'm thinking maybe that's what she's getting at. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, we do in the exhibit is, um, you know, that I think there's maybe this um, misconception that women weren't really active in the community before 1920, before getting the vote, you know, that's, that somehow opened all of these doors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, you know, what I attempt to do in the exhibit is really show that women have been active in St. Louis from the very beginning. Um, and that really never stopped. Um, that there are stories in every decade and every year of, of women doing things, individuals mm -hmm. and collectively. Um, and so there was n really never a, a magic moment, um, you know, where all of a sudden, you know, women had more power. I think it became more visible um, in lots of ways, you know, because newspapers actually, you know, started including women's names and, you know, images and things. But, um, but I mean, women have always been active, have always worked, have always, um, you know, done things out of the ordinary. Um, and so, so yeah, there really wasn't ever kind of a, like an aha moment. Um, it was just one of those things that maybe just, we don't know as much about. Um, so yeah. Well, this is fantastic. And I can, I can attest to that too, that we've, you know, we've done some programs with women and I know we talk about power in terms of they have more political power and more of that but there are still women doing things at a neighborhood level at a <laughs> at a next door neighbor level <laughs> absolutely you know getting involved with their communities on in all sorts of ways so and we've gotten to meet a lot of them during this time in the programming we've done for the exhibit which has been um, a real privilege and inspiration um, for sure for sure yeah and I think so. um 
you know, especially for women of color, um, you know, they've been doing things, they've been organizing, they've had clubs, they've, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, and yet that was never covered in mainstream media. Um, and so there's such a rich history that still deserves so much more research and, and focus right. that we're just, just beginning. Stories. Yeah, that we're just beginning to discover these amazing, amazing things that were happening that we just ignored or overlooked. Um, right. So. The story not being told doesn't mean it's not there, right? right exactly. <laughs> you said it much, much more um, eloquently than I did. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to see, I think we have, actually, we have somebody just asking if we can reiterate your email um, oh, if they sure. want to reach out to you with questions. Yeah, um, it's just kmoon, M-O-O-N, at mohistory.org. So hopefully that's easy. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, Emily, you can put it in the chat or something. You know but, what, um, I can do that. That is easy. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but yes, please feel free to email me. Um, this is my favorite part of the job. <laughs> Wonderful. And I think that's all. I'm just double checking, but I think that's all the questions we had for today. I want to just thank you again for coming on. And um, hopefully some of you are inspired to buy the book. I put the link in the chat. You can, of course, also go in and get it if you're comfortable with that. Um, and if you are not comfortable going into a building, you can also call our shop and I think they will arrange a curbside pickup for you if you'd like to do that. So um, no excuses not to get the book. <laughs> yeah, the, book, the books, the books in the shop are all signed. I've signed all of them. Oh, um, wonderful. But if you, oh, if you want on Amazon, you can get it that way too. Perfect. I'm pulling that slide back up yep. real quick so you can see that beautiful cover again. And then I'm going to share, uh, again, I want to thank all of the sponsors for the Beyond the Ballot exhibit, our presenting sponsor, Wells Fargo, our education sponsor, Emerson. Um, we're just so appreciative of all of the support um, and getting these stories out. It's just a really amazing opportunity for us to tell um, some unknown stories. And also putting up this slide here so you can see some of the programs we have coming up. Of course, we have Veterans Day coming up. So our Soldiers Memorial and Military Museum has some programming for that. And then next week, we'll be uh, doing a little bit of an early birthday celebration for Mark Twain, looking at um, his role as a humanitarian and um, his connections with the African-American community in Missouri and beyond. Um, so of course, I said, you can see all of the programs we have coming up at our website, which is mohistory.org on our events calendar or you can check them out on our Facebook page for Missouri History Museum. And of course, as I also mentioned, you can catch them later on our Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel if you can't get there in person. And please don't forget to take the survey um, that pops up and let us know what you thought about today's program. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. We really appreciate you uh, taking some of your time to, to be here with us. And thanks again to Katie. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much.